but the fact is, the guy's been around uh, in public life for over 30 years. He knows what he's doing, and what he's actually trying to do in some cases is elevate the discussion way above what anybody on that debate stage is capable of handling so he, so w when you talk about the economy they're all talking like parrots oh we need lower taxes and a balanced budget whatever you know all they can do is just throw out the gop talking points whereas he's saying you know it's not not enough to just repeat the same old thing. This isn't, this isn't 1982 anymore, you know, where you can just repeat Ronald Reagan's platform. You know, I mean, we, d have you looked at what's going on in the world? We've got these major financial convulsions going on that are going to sweep over us one of these days. It's time to talk a little bit more specifically about what's going on. So he's saying, we have to figure out why do we have recessions in the first place. President Obama is getting a bump after the mission to kill Osama bin Laden. Some on the left are now saying President Obama is unbeatable in his re-election effort. Why are those pundits on the left wrong, and what is his biggest vulnerability? Congressman Paul. His biggest vulnerability will be the economy and high prices. He hasn't dealt with that because he doesn't understand the business cycle, as so many others don't. So the economy will be the big issue. My theory is that people vote from their bellies because it's whether they're hungry or not or have jobs and need things. That's why people vote. And we're in big trouble. Prices are going up. Unemployment is continuing to go up. And we have not had the necessary correction for the financial bubble created by our federal reserve system and until you allow the correction and the liquidation of debt you can't have growth instead of just having our neat little uh, you know cute little packaged responses why do we have them what's the role of the federal reserve in bringing them about what's the role of our funny money the, the monetary policy we have money that the government could just create out of thin air how about all these issues this is wonderful. This is where we may have made our greatest strides for the American people to wake up and realize you can't print papers and money in secrecy by the Federal Reserve and pretend it's a creation of wealth. We have gotten the attention of the American people dealing with our monetary system and the Federal Reserve, and it's time we not only audit the Federal Reserve, but also in due time get rid of the Federal Reserve that aren't going to be mentioned once by anybody on this stage, but these are the things you guys need to know about right now because I've been predicting them for years. As soon as we got this monetary system in the early 70s, I said, this is going to end in grief. But I was stunned by reading a statement you made in the banking committee uh, yes. on September 10th, 2003. In fact, I reprinted the whole thing in my book. I want, to, I want Americans who hear leaders saying every day, we could have never seen this coming. This was a shock. How did this happen? I want to read what you said five years hmm. before the collapse. The special privileges granted to Fannie and Freddie have distorted the housing market by allowing them to attract capital that they could not attract under pure market conditions. Like all artificially created bubbles, the boom in housing prices cannot last forever. When housing prices fall, homeowners will experience difficulty as their equity is wiped out. Furthermore, the holders of the mortgage debt will also have a loss. These losses will be greater than they would have otherwise been had government policy not actively encouraged overinvesting in housing. And you go on to oh say because God. so many people will invest in housing, the damage will be catastrophic. Congressman, how could it be that you knew this on the banking committee in 2003 and nobody else did until after the collapse? Well, I, w I would think the easiest explanation is is uh, Washington, D.C. is permeated by Keynesian economic thinking. Very few even know the name Austrian economics and understand the business cycle. I was concerned about the building of the bubble since 1971 when gold uh, was dealing from the dollar. Again, the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. Now what is this action which 
is very technical. What does it mean for you? Let me lay to, re lay to rest the bugaboo of what is called devaluation. If you want to buy a foreign car or take a trip abroad, market conditions may cause your dollar to buy slightly less. But if you are among the overwhelming majority of Americans who buy American-made products in America, your dollar will be worth just as much tomorrow as it is today. The effect of this action, in other words, will be to stabilize the dollar. So since that time, the bubble has been gradually being inflated, but it got out of hand in the 1990s as well as after 2000, Bernanke taking interest rates down to 1%. To me, uh, the biggest surprise was, although I was very concerned in 2003, I was concerned before that, I'm surprised it lasted to 2007. That's when the bubble really burst, but it was amazing how long it lasts. And to me, the more amazing thing right now is not only has the financial system collapsed, which is very, very bad and very dangerous, I believe that what we're moving toward now is the collapse of the dollar. And the collapse of a dollar, because it's the international reserve currency, I think is going to be much worse than what we have already witnessed. It's going to be a global calamity, because when governments have the ability to create all the money they want, you better believe they're going to exercise that power. And you better believe the result is going to be a huge amount of money created, huge moral hazard, because every financial firm will know the government has the power to create all the money it needs, so they can be as reckless as they want. We just print up the money. And, and the result is going to be massive spending, massive debt, unpayable financial and fiscal crises. And here we are living through it. And it's amazing to me that Americans actually think they've got a choice here. Well, gee, I could vote for this one or this one. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Who's the only one who could explain to you what's going on, who did explain it to you 30 or 40 years ago when nobody was listening? And who's the only one who can form a coherent sentence about the Federal Reserve today? So all this money spent, and all this policing in the world, and all this deficit, and financially, uh, we're coming down. I mean, I, just today, the dollar went down 1.2% in one day after this steady erosion. It comes from the fact of deficits. And why does that hurt the dollar? Because we don't have enough money. We don't tax enough. We don't, can't tax anymore. People are overtaxed. We can't borrow anymore because interest rates will go up. So we print the money. And the more money you print, the further the dollar goes down, then everything goes up in price. So it's a cycle that's coming to an end. And the value of the dollar is really telling the whole story. We've overextended ourselves because we do not challenge the whole notion of what we ought to be doing here and what our government ought to be all about. Because we have drifted so far from the original intent of the Constitution, there is no hesitation. There are debates that go on here endlessly. One side of the aisle says, well, we need more and more money for the military. We can't cut one single cent on overseas expenditure. The other side says we can't cut the entitlements. And then there's an agreement. We raise both. My idea is to have a strong national defense and to get this budget under control, reject the notion that we need to run an empire. We can't afford it. It's going to come down. It always comes down. It has come down all throughout history because eventually the currency is destroyed. We're in, uh, we're in 130 countries. We have 700 bases. Our military now is in worse shape than it was five years ago, according to our military. So it's time we look at the strategic, the philosophic problems. And I say, unless we do this, this will, be, this will end badly. It's going to end with a major economic crisis. It's going to be worldwide, and we here at home will suffer, not only economically, but inevitably, under these conditions, the people lose their liberty. And our liberties are being eroded every single day that we're here. L listen, everybody, I'm, you know, I respect what everybody on this stage has just said about the economy. I agree that we're in trouble. And I hate to boast. It's the thing I most hate in this world. But let's face it, folks. Who on this stage predicted the current financial crisis? Could, could we have a show of hands? <laughs> Who on this stage saw it coming? So, therefore, since the answer is no one other than me, uh, how are you all so sure you know the way out? How could you? You don't know what caused it. Or how many people have been warning 
that we would wind up in a major monetary fiasco and crisis ever since we got this monetary system that we have now. How many people here have read a book about the monetary system? Show of hands, please. Name me the title. I mean, I would love to see that and say, now, look, you know, it's true. You could hire economic advisors. That's true. But for heaven's sake, would you rather have a pupil or a teacher in the White House at a time like this?